All right, how's it going, everybody? I'm Julian, and this is Dr. Jason Staples. Today we're going to be talking about his paper, Lord, Lord, Jesus as Yahweh in Matthew and Luke. So without further ado, um, Jason, you can just start explaining what the overview is of the paper and exactly what your reasoning was. Um, okay, we'll start actually with the reasoning. Um, sure. Main, main, uh, the main source of this of this paper actually came from just an offhand thing that happened some years back where uh, I was in a class and um, we were discussing the prophets uh, and I think we we're in Ezekiel at the time we were talking about Ezekiel and the uh, the professor was was you know we were we were discussing various things and the professor ma made mention of um, you know specific we, we he quoted a specific set of verses or whatever and w during the verses uh, he he you know he's reading through Hebrew and he says uh, something along the lines of you know and uh, Adonai Adonai said to you know me or you know and I said Adonai Adonai uh, mm -hmm. and it just stuck with me all of a sudden I was like wait a second Adonai Adonai I should have thought about this before like that mm -hmm. <sighs> that Jesus says Lord Lord in the New Testament in a couple right. places I I not connected these things but i bet you that's what's going on here and it and, and you know this was years and years ago and so it, it, i just kind of presumed that that's that was the default understanding within scholarship at the time and didn't really check into it uh and you know it's like oh i can't believe i hadn't seen that before uh and just for background on that for many of you uh who are not aware of how this works in uh in Hebrew, the, the general tradition, there, there are two long-standing traditions for what to do when you see the, uh, the four letters, the, the Tetragrammaton, the, the, the special name of the God of Israel, mm -hmm. uh, which you vocalized specifically when you, when you uh, read the title of my paper. When you see those four letters in, uh, in Jewish tradition, you do not pr pronounce those four letters you do not pronounce those those letters as though the con according to the consonants you pronounce them you pronounce them with a circumlocution you pronounce them with another word that is substituted for it right. that represents that that word but you don't pronounce it as a way to uh, demonstrate specific uh, the, the holiness of that name and the specific uh, uh, concerns pertaining to that name it actually derives to the idea of the fence around the Torah. And the uh, the command uh, not to make empty use of the name or to bear the name of Adonai for empty use, uh, one of the ten commands in Exodus twenty, uh, and so you know one way to make sure you don't make empty use of it is to not make use of it directly, yeah, right? Yeah, so right. Um, and you know this is for English speakers, you know there are all sorts of these kinds of circumlocutions for a lot of things. I mean, gosh. <laughs> It's right. just another way of saying God, but you just, uh, you know, substitute it so that people who might be offended by God or, you know, might feel that you are being overly uh, flippant about some divine thing. Gosh, right. or gosh, darn it. OMG, right. I mean, yeah. th that's a specific <laughs> substitute for something else. Right. right? <clears throat> so circumlocution is a, is a common thing. And in the uh, in the Jewish tradition, the the older way of doing this is to substitute for the name you substitute and you read the word Adonai which just means Lord essentially mm -hmm. or master something like that um, and that's that's pretty standard uh, another way of doing it that is a little bit more recent is to say Hashem instead of Adonai because Adonai has become so associated with the name in certain circles that you actually don't want to use that because that already implies the name <laughs> so you just say the name, the name. Right. hashem just means yeah. the name in hebrew so okay. you're referring to the name right uh so those are alternate ways of doing this but the the older way is just basically to read lord in place of the name itself so you don't say the name you say lord uh now where that becomes significant is when you get as far as for the purposes of what we're talking about here is there are a number of cases in the Hebrew Bible where you have the word Adonai partnered with the name, the special name, Y-H-W-H or Yod-Heh-Vav-Heh. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, and so in those cases, substituting the word Adonai leads to this sort of awkward doubling, Adonai, Adonai, if you read right. it normally. Now, a, really there is a, a, a standard way of, of reading that together to where in the tradition, a lot of times, uh, and this is sort of the Masoretic way of doing it, the very old, old way of doing this, uh, is you read the second one or you read the Tetragrammaton as uh, Elohim in this case, even though it's even though that's just a word for God. Uh, that means just God or gods. It's actually plural, uh, but it takes a, a singular noun in the in, or a singular verb in the in the Hebrew Bible. Um, but you read it as Adonai Elohim, and it's sort of understood again. One of those words is the name, uh, but it, you could also read it just Adonai Adonai. Uh, mm -hmm. And I've been familiar more with other ways of doing this, but m the professor when he read it Adonai Adonai, it just went oh. <laughs> Because there are those three places in the Hebrew or in the New Testament, in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, where Jesus refers to himself mm -hmm. in the Greek form of Lord, Lord, or the Greek translation of Adonai, Adonai in uh, the vocative, Kurie, Kurie, uh, Jesus refers to himself as that, as the doubled Adonai. Um, Can you explain real quick what the vocative sense is? So vocative is just direct address. Uh, so it's, you know, in, in an inflected language like Greek, uh, and, you know, for those of you out there who are familiar with, you know, Spanish or French or these sorts of things, you have different endings, you have different forms of words uh, that are used for a specific part of speech uh, or specific use of the word. And so in this case, a noun that is uh, used in to in direct speech to another person uh ha, it takes its own form so courier is the is the uh the vocative form the direct address form of the word kurios which is the word that's used in greek to translate the hebrew word adonai it's also the word that's typically used in the old greek uh to translate the name so then that leads to the same problem in greek that you get when pronouncing Hebrew out loud of, okay, well, you have the word Adonai next to the, the, the name. Do you just say Adonai Adonai? Or when you're translating and you're used to translating kurios for in, in every place where there's the name, you say kurios, and then you have the word Adonai, which you also translate typically with kurios. Do you just say kurios, kurios, or kurie, kurie? Uh, and there are a number of and so basically what I did is in this article, once I learned that there, it, it, I just happened to, uh, to check into this. Somebody had asked me about it and I, uh, I checked into this or I think somebody had asked me about it, checked into it to say, okay, well, you know what, what if, where, where has somebody pointed this out in the past that, you know, this doubled courier is just a reference to the name. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it's a way of, of highlighting that. And it turned out nobody had noticed it. Uh, so there, it just the there had been a sort of deafness to this specific echo. Uh, you even had a, a a recent book, and this actually might have been what stimulated it in, uh, in checking into like has nobody else noticed this? There had been a recent book uh, when I started working on this article uh, by Kevin Rowe, a professor over at Duke, uh, mm -hmm. and he did a he did a book on uh, on kurios on the on the concept of Lord or the you know referring to Jesus as Lord and what, how all that all worked in the gospel of Luke. And he never actually really addressed the doubling question in this one specific phrase, uh, or this one specific verse in the gospel of Luke in Luke six forty six. Uh, and so he, when, when he didn't mention it, I happened to, I, I happened to, uh, run, run across him when I was over at Duke and asked him about it. I was like, so have you seen anybody that's commented on this? And he looked at me and he went, Oh my gosh, <laughs> I, I can't believe I missed that, but I think you, Whoa. that might be right. You should write an article on this. Wow. So, um, you know, you should look into that, but you know, I didn't, I haven't seen anybody that's mentioned that and I, yeah, you should do that. So that sort of began this. Uh, and what I did is I, I did a, a deep dive into all prior, uh, Greek literature and all the previous evidence, uh, all the pre-Christian evidence and, and some manuscript evidence from the post-Christian period uh, 
basically looking at how the concept of uh, kurios or how the word kurios uh, works in, in these contexts and how, you know, in what context do we get a double kurios? Mm-hmm. When does it actually happen? And when do we get doubling like this with, with vocatives as well was, was another uh, point that I, I, I spent time on. And, and the conclusion of this was that the only place in any pre-Christian material that you have the double form of kurios or kurie kurie or kurios kurios appearing, you know, side by side, the only places where you see that are translations of Adonai plus the Tetragrammaton. Uh, that's the only places in all of Greek literature where you see that happen. Uh, and after the gospels are written, the only places that you see that happen where you have the double kurios are places that are referring to either the gospel they're quoting or referring to the gospels, Jesus Mm -hmm. using this, or they're quoting older, you know, old Testament uh, you know, early Jewish literature references to the double kurios with where one of them is the name. So those are the only places where you see this. Uh, there is actually one other place where, uh, there is a double kurios in, in, uh, that I didn't mention in the, in, in the article. And that's in Exodus 34 when, uh, God shows his glory to, to, uh, to Moses. And, uh, he declares his name before him and it was actually the name the name and so you can get a double kurios in that context but it's actually usually just in greek manuscripts that we have it's only one kurios uh in those cases they they don't actually take it twice so that's an interesting question of whether there's a text critical there's a text critical question of whether the name was originally there twice and all all the things that are going on there but in any case the conclusion of this the basic argument of the article is that Mm -hmm. uh once we understand that prior to the, the authorship of the Gospels, the only time you ever see Kurios doubled is in these references to the God of Israel as Lord Adonai, mm-hmm. as Lord, Lord, uh, that when you then get, given that this is not actually that uncommon, but it, you know, in terms of as a translation of the, uh, those cases in Hebrew, it's not all that uncommon, but it's, 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 it never shows up in any other context. Once you get to the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, if you see the double kurios, that's going to ring like a bell, if that's what you're familiar okay. with hearing when you're listening to the Greek text out loud and you hear kurios, kurios, or kurie, kurie. Okay. If that's what you're used to hearing, and that always refers to a specific place where the name is, and then you hear that in Greek in Matthew or Luke, and each of these is is uh, the first time when... The, the word kurios is in, in each of those gospels. This is the first time where the word kurios refers to Jesus. That's not by accident. Mm-hmm. The reader is going to go, Oh, like, wait a second. Like what, what is he saying? <laughs> like, right. who is this? Uh, so my argument in the article is that, uh, that both Matthew and Luke use the double form of the kurios to eliminate any sort of ambiguity about what they're trying to, what, what they're saying, what they're saying Jesus is. And by putting it in his mouth, they're essentially saying that uh, that Jesus is is claiming to be one with or or, or you know the, whole, the one with Adonai or, or, or identical with Adonai, uh, the the whole the, the rightful holder of the name of the God of Israel, uh, and that 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 basically is is the 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 general sense of what's happening in in uh, in Matthew and Luke that they're 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 making they're in Jesus' mouth they're putting words in Jesus' mouth of. Uh, self-identifying himself with the God of Israel. So English speakers or English readers today would clearly see John as obviously saying Jesus is God. Matthew and Luke, obviously, I mean, this is the whole point of your paper, right? People don't genuinely see Jesus being called Adonai, you know, in Matthew and Luke. But someone who would be familiar with the Greek back in the day, you're saying that they would be just, it would be just as obvious for them as reading John. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So okay. someone who, so anyone who's familiar with reading the Hebrew Bible or reading the, the Jewish Bible in Greek mm-hmm. is going to have come across hundreds of places where the word kurios is doubled. Right. And in every case it refers it, it, when it's doubled. So there are places where it just translates, you know, in some cases, uh, my Lord Adoni, like referring to a person, just like mm-hmm. in, in you know the Greek of that period, the word kurios can refer to just sir, or you know master, 
something like that. Uh, and that's the that's the issue is that when you get in Matthew and Luke and other places, when you have just a single curios, it can just be, you know, sir, you know, please come and do or, you know, right. Lord, Lord, My you Lord. know, in a in a titular sense. Uh, and there's an ambiguity there. But if you're a Greek reader or hearer and you're used to listening to the Jewish Bible and you're accustomed to hearing the doubled uh, 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 kurios, the doubled kurios in the Greek Bible is unambiguous. It's always the name. It always refers to the name. Okay. Uh, and so for those readers or those hearers, when they're when they're getting to these places in Matthew and Luke, that that's going to stick out. That's going to stand out as much as the ego a me, the I am sayings in John, which, you know, the, the one in John six is the most, you know, most obvious of those, you know, before Abraham was, I am, that's right. the one where, you know, you can kind of look at that and circle it and be like, okay, look, I mean, that's, that's kind of that, the ambiguity kind of is, is dropped here. Right. Uh, right. In Luke six forty six, why do you address me as courier courier and not do what I say? That's going to stand out the same amount for someone who's used to hearing Lord, Lord in their Bible. So a, a good way to think about this for an English reader is if in uh, the book of Ezekiel, and so in Ezekiel, uh, you have um, 200. So the combination of Adonai plus the Tetragrammaton plus the name appears 319 times in the Masoretic text total. Okay. So in the in the 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 normal Hebrew Bible that we have today, 319 times, 217 of those show up in Ezekiel. So if we were just going to translate the way that in, in English, the way that this might work uh, in for a standard Greek reader in the first century, mm -hmm. then what we would have to do is have in those 217 instances in Ezekiel, Instead of translating as normally happens in, say, the NIV or the NRSV or whatever, those you'll see it over and over again in Ezekiel, Lord with God in all caps. And that's Adonai Elohim. Essentially, that's presuming the pronunciation Adonai Elohim, Lord God. Or in uh, the NIV, you'll often have sovereign Lord in those cases where it's the doubled Lord. Mm -hmm. And it's because in English, it's awkward to have Lord, Lord. And so the translators just out of convention say, OK, we're going to take sovereign Lord and we're going to have the one that's in all caps is going to be the the reference to the name and the, all, the, the, the small caps will be the way of designating that this is the name in the, in the text. And, you know, so Lord, God in all caps, the God as, is actually the name. If we were going to translate this the way that it would have sounded to a Greek a standard Greek hearer, and this is the this is the I present the evidence for this in the article. If we we're going to present this the way that it would be, you know, for a standard Greek reader, a Greek hearer in the first century, instead of translating sovereign Lord or Lord God, we would just translate Lord Lord. And if we were accustomed to 217 times in the book of Ezekiel hearing and the Lord Lord said to me. And Lord Lord came to me and said, yeah. And, you know, these sorts of things over and over and over again, if that's what we were accustomed to. And then we got to. Luke six forty six. Why do you address me as Lord, Lord and not do what I say? Mm. Yeah, that would then ring out. But the thing is, if right. we're used to reading in English where that doubling is removed by translation convention, a convention that is not there in the earliest Greek manuscripts that we have, then we don't we don't hear the echo the same way. Where but they the would hear that. Removed? What's that? Is the doubling being removed? Because you know modern translations in English, the ones that I looked at, in Luke six forty six it says Lord Lord. Are you talking about the doubling being I'm, removed in Ezekiel? In Ezekiel, yeah, yeah. So in okay. Ezekiel, okay. so for example, uh, this is just <laughs> Ezekiel fourteen. I'm just going to go through Ezekiel fourteen. Therefore, speak to them and say to them, thus says Lord, Lord. Now, in the NRSV, it's thus says the Lord God. Right. But mm -hmm. Ezekiel 14, 4, thus speak to them and say to them, thus says Lord, Lord. Ezekiel 14, 6, therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says Lord, Lord, repent and turn away from your idols. Ezekiel 14, 11, 
Uh, then they will be my people and I will be their God, says Lord, Lord. Ezekiel 14, 14. Even if Noah, Daniel and Job and these three were in it, they would save only their own lives by their justness, says Lord, Lord. Ezekiel 14, 16. Even if these three men were in it, as I live, says Lord, Lord, they would save neither sons nor daughters. Ezekiel 14, 18. As I live, says Lord, Lord, they, uh, uh, or uh, I just read that one. Uh, Ezekiel 14, 20. Even if Noah, Daniel and Job were, uh, were in it. And once again, it says Lord, Lord. Ezekiel 14, 21, therefore, thus says Lord, Lord, how much more when I send upon Jerusalem? Ezekiel 14, 23, uh, it was not without cause that I did all I've done in it, says Lord, Lord. That's just yeah. one chapter of that's Ezekiel. Painfully obvious. Okay? Yes. If that's what you're used to reading and you hear this in the synagogue, and you, you know, you've, you've grown up with this, and then you get to, and, and again, by translation convention in English, that doubling is not heard for an English reader. If you're used to that, and then you get to Luke 646, why do you address me as Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Mm. Yeah, that's going to stick out like an ego me in, in John. Right. It's going to be painfully obvious, like you said, that something's going on here. Okay. Yeah, I was originally going to ask, because, well, maybe you know this, I would expect Lord, Lord, uh, the occurrences of it in the Old Testament are far more numerous than ego me, right? And we clearly see nowadays, you can go to the Greek, no problem. He says, I am ego me. Yeah, we got that. Jesus is God. And I was going to ask, why would it not be so obvious for the people reading Lord, Lord? But if you're saying that it, the doubling has been removed, um, you said this in the paper, actually, maybe this is a different thing, but you said there was a tradition of scribes wanting to remove redundancy Mm -hmm. Is that what you're talking about there? Mm -hmm. Where they think, oh, maybe this is just redundant. We might as well just remove it. Is that translator saying, we know what this context is and we're going to remove it anyway? Or they're just ignorant of the fact that it's a doubling for a specific purpose saying Adonai, Elohim or whatever. So uh, scribes don't like redundancy in general. Uh, they, in, in, you know, we see this in English as well, but um, so this is, there's a, there's a, uh, Another scholar, Kuk Hong, who says, uh, and I quote this in the, in the article, uh, the Adonai euphemism can be traced by examining how Adonai Adonai is rendered in textual transmission. That is, whether it is faithfully retained or altered to a form that reflects an attempt to avoid the putative redundancy, Adonai Adonai, my Lord Adonai, is a straightforward title. Were it not for the redundancy, this title in itself presents no need for modification in its oral and written transmission. So... The, the thing is, once you have that, you know, the redundancy where when it's spoken aloud or when it's, you know, read with the circumlocution, it, it sounds redundant. How is that handled is the question. And some scribes do handle it differently, right? Uh, and in Greek, one of the common ways of doing this was, uh, was to, well, I'll, I'll go through a few of these things. So you get some alterations of the formula in First Chronicles. So uh, you you get you know Adonai Adonai uh, in Second Samuel mm -hmm. gets replaced in the in the Hebrew text. So again, background for some of those who are not as familiar. First Chronicles uses First and Second Samuel as a source, and First and Second Kings as a source. First Chronicles knows those books and uses them and in, in many cases directly quotes them and then adds its own material in the parallel passages where you have first samuel using second samuel so it's a parallel passage first chronicles never retains adonai adonai <clears throat> excuse me because it's doubled in that case in First Chronicles, the, the parallel always replaces the double Adonai Adonai with either a single Adonai or Elohim. Now, on okay. two occasions in First Chronicles 17, so First Chronicles 17, 16 and First Chronicles 17, 17, you have what's called the Palestinian Kare. This is the, the tradition that comes in of Adonai Elohim, and it replaces it with those two words together. So... What we find, the reason that this is important is that this helps us understand that by the time First Chronicles is being written, this is evidence that there's already a circumlocution in play. Right. 
that First Chronicles is presuming that people are reading these two words as Adonai in each case. Okay. So, and that's very early. That's, you know, yeah. First Chronicles probably late 4th century BC. So they're, they're saying, hey, you guys already know this. We're just going to write for, I don't know, ease of space or something, right? We're it's not even write. that. It's that they're trying oh, okay. to avoid having people saying the term twice when they're reading aloud because it's it, and so it sounds awkward to them okay and so they're just when they rewrite the when they when they copy the passage over they're just they're just obviating that by not including the title but see in the time that first first samuel is written first samuel is written when people are almost certainly pronouncing the name on the regular so mm -hmm. adonai is going to be paired with the pronunciation of the name rather than the the rather than circum rather than the circumlocution. So at that time, having those two together, it makes sense. It's just a name. It's a title plus the name. Later on, by the time you get to first Chronicles, the chronicler presumes that when they're reading, when people are reading the four consonants of the name, they're actually pronouncing Adonai. And so at that point, when the when that's being written down by this new author, these new editors, they don't include the doubling, even when the doubling shows up in their source. They just include the name, or they just include, and in one case, Adonai Elohim. So they they change it for their own, for the pronunciation of their own bit. But the problem is that you still have a lot of older Hebrew texts that have the doubling. And the question is, what do Greek translators end up doing with that, knowing that these Greek translators are aware that by the time that this is being translated into Greek, it's it's a it's redundant. A one. Yeah, yeah, it's a single thing. And so then you have to get into how they handle it. And there are a variety of different ways that this gets handled in um, in in Greek translation. One of the most common early ones that we see. So there are some early Greek manuscripts in which what you have is you have it translates up to kurios for the for the Adonai and then for the name it actually either puts in four dots or it puts in the Hebrew letters themselves so you have kurios and then you have Hebrew letters that are in place and it actually looks like P Iota P Iota uh, which you know then if you're completely ignorant it'd be read PP -P, uh, which is sort of funny yes uh, but um, but or at least for an English speaker, it is. Um, but uh, there are different ways of, of translating that uh, in that context for those early manuscripts that we see. And so in those cases, you have kurios plus the consonants or, or for, for in Hebrew or kurios plus four dots or in some cases, kurios plus a space or mm -hmm. just a single kurios. Now, the question is, when a reader of Greek is reading this aloud, and they come across kurios plus four dots or kurios plus the, the Hebrew consonants, what do they read in their head? Or what do they read aloud? What do they pronounce? Right. Not just what's written. Right. Mm. And the evidence is very strong. And we've got some comments on this from like origin and other places. The evidence is very strong that when you'd see this out loud, it would be pronounced kurios, kurios. You just pronounce the name or as as kurios again okay. and so this then sets the stage for again the person who's reading ezekiel in the first century ce second century ce and they're reading they're reading the the, the greek bible they're accustomed to hearing the double form mm -hmm. in these places where it's retained and it is retained in those places and there are also other manuscripts in which you have the double form retained where it's just two kurios Two, two Greek kurios words spelled out in Greek back to back. And that shows up as well. So once you have that, that, that communicates then that, that someone's going to be able to hear this echo very, very well once they get to Matthew or Luke. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is just how I'm seeing it. I know that for the entire time from Exodus 20 onwards, right? The Jews have had a, um, prohibition against reading or saying God's name, right? This seems like all of this stems from maybe a hyper-literal using of that, right? They don't want to write 
his name or they don't want to write his name or say his name. So they go with uh, circumlocution. Then you've got the doubling. Then the doubling gets simplified. It, this just seems like it's stemming from this. Uh, I don't know what you would call it, but like a hyperfixation on not saying God's name. Would it be better nowadays if we have the English translations to just write, I don't know, even the tetragrammaton in there? Would that make more sense, do you think, or would it be even useful to do? Well, I, so I wouldn't call it hyperliteral. I would say that there is a concern for ensuring that they that that they obey the commands. Right. 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 No so empty using of God's name. Right. right. If you make empty use of God's name, which is the specific name, right? It's not God. Right. 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 If you make use of the specific name in the wrong way, then you've clearly disobeyed the command of God. So one way to ensure that you cannot do it. Yeah. Right. You, you know, it's it, the way I, one of the ways that I teach this with, with students in, in uh, when I teach introduction to the Hebrew Bible is, you know, I explain that, you know, that you have, uh, you know, a com it, it's a common thing in like a, a conservative Christian youth group culture to have the question of like, how far with my boyfriend or girlfriend is, is too far before, right. you know, I'm guilty of, of fornication, right? Right. How far right. can I go? Yes. And, you know, there's a certain point at which like, okay, it's obvious that, that the line has been crossed, but like, there's some potentially blurry lines here where like, you know, is, is fooling around this much, like too much is God not ha well, one way of dealing with that and what you hear a lot of, especially in more conservative kind of purity culture uh, 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 ends of this is, OK, look, obviously sex is out. Right. You know, you get that, that like that. That's that's past the line. Yes. But like the definition of what constitutes that might be different. Like what what what, what where how far do you have to go for that to actually qualify as that Bill Clinton might have a different definition of that than say many other people. Yes. But what you end up with is say, um, you know, we're going to rule out Bill Clinton's gray area here draw as well. <laughs> What's that? I said, draw the line there. That's yeah. Good. We're going to, yeah. we're going to make sure that that's out too, because you know, even if even if we're going to, let's say, not draw the line there, if you're going there, you're probably going to go ahead and cross the line all the way right. at some point. So let's just not put ourselves in that position. And you know what? Even getting like even before you've gotten there, there's all sorts of other steps that you can take along the way. And eventually you get to where it's like, OK, look, don't kiss, don't hold hands, stay six inches apart, leave room for the Holy Ghost because holding hands leads to, you know, leads to making out, making out leads to, you know, Clintonism, Clintonism leads to the whole thing. <laughs> Therefore, and, and the whole thing might lead to dancing, right? That might be worst of all, right? right. So <laughs> therefore, what you do is you draw the line, you know, out here to ensure okay. that there's no chance that you're going to be put into a position where you might break it. I know there's a verse somewhere that says, uh, don't even have an appearance of evil, right? So I've heard that thrown around a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a mistranslation of a, of a verse, right. but it's a regularly uh, cited mistranslation. Yes, yes. right. Um, so you're saying it's the same thing here where they're maybe maybe they didn't have the line all the way back there at the beginning, but at least as we see it now, it's like, don't even bother. But actually, that leads me to another so, question. So for what it's worth, by the way, when I translate, so getting to answer your question in terms of how we should translate, when I translate the Hebrew Bible and, you know, in, in the books that I've that I've had, when I translate the name, I translate it YHWH. Now, when I do audiobooks, I trans I pronounce it Adonai. OK, so I will okay. read Lord That's Adonai. Yeah, uh, yeah, because I will okay. translate Adonai as Lord, but then I will have the, the name in there in its in, in the consonants. OK. So uh, and then I and then I will say Adonai just out of out of uh, out of respect in that context so when I do the audiobooks. It doesn't sound clunky saying Lord Lord, but you still get the point across by saying, "Hey, this is Lord Lord." It's not just a single curse. Right. 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 Okay. Um, that was leading me to another question. That whole <laughs> conversation about Clintonism and everything. Um, so I can see why they wouldn't want to pronounce it that way. Why go as far as to say? We're not even going to write it. We're just going to simplify it and not have it be 
curious curiously. That so seems normally like a step that too far. Go ahead, go ahead. Normally, that's probably not what happened. So in terms of not wanting to write it, first of all, you did you did have among certain devout Jews the idea that if you do write the name, then you needed to wash your hands afterwards. OK, as a way of uh, 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 and, and you have this whole discussion in rabbinic Judaism about, you know, what defiles the hands in this context. Right. And it has to right. do with con uh, uh, contact with the truly holy and the name is the yes. holy. So right. now you're differentiating between like writing everything common and then you come to the name, you write the name and then you wash your hands and then you come back and you. Okay. So that was that back would be that would that, that would not be entirely uncommon. And it was not regarded as tedious, by the way, by oh, by those okay. scribes that you know, I mean, that's that's yeah. not a value that they would that they would have. I mean, think about handwriting entire manuscripts here. The whole process is tedious. There's nothing that's going to make that less tedious. Right. True. So. um. So what they're doing is they're they're copying these things down and they're and they're doing that. But uh, what you're referring to is you're still going back to the first chronicles phenomenon of why right why leave it out simplify that it's not about not writing the name and in many cases they're they're, they're okay. actually what they're dropping is they're not dropping the name they're dropping the the adjective or they're dropping the they're dropping the title, title. Adonai. Okay. And then they're just writing the name. Why? Because if you pronounce the name Adonai, you don't need Adonai there beforehand. So you just you leave the right. name in. Right. So they're not they're not dropping the name in that case. They're just leaving. They're they're dropping the they're dropping the the additional title because it's unnecessary okay. because they're already pronouncing it the other way. So as far as the Hebrew goes, they say Adonai. They know what they're talking about. But when you translate it to Greek, you have Kurios, which could just mean sir or lord like you said yep that's when you have the confusion coming in well you, again you don't really have a bunch of confusion again the question is in these cases where you're translating in greek a passage that has kurios plus the name mm -hmm. if you're pronouncing the name in greek as kurios <laughs> then you still have that doubling okay. so what do you do yeah. Yeah. and there are a variety of ways of handling that and okay. uh again the the default way when you know, in the time immediately preceding the life of Jesus and the, and the life of the, uh, the the writers of the gospel and, you know, working through those first, you know, century, the first century or two of the common era, mm -hmm. the as far as we can tell and as far as I you know was able to gather from the manuscript evidence and other evidence that we have for that, when they came across that sort of thing in Greek manuscripts, they just pronounced that they pronounced Kurios twice. Okay. Just what they did. So. I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. In your paper, you talked about the the traditional way of understanding this doubling in Luke 646 and in Matthew and so on. Uh, can you explain where you think that tradition comes from? And in releasing this paper and talking about it, I know you've gone on at least one other YouTube channel to talk about this. Have you seen a shift in the way that people are thinking about this? Or is it still kind of majority the tradition of hey, maybe this is just an emphasis or there's an emotional thing going on here. Yeah, so there are uh, the, the, the general thing. First of all, most of the commentaries and articles discussing these passages in in uh, in the modern era haven't really paid a lot of attention to the doubling. <laughs> They've just noticed like, OK, well, Curios is 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 here twice and. and the ones that that have mentioned it have typically just said, well, you know, that's just a Semiticism. It's like how how how, you know, people who speak Semitic languages talk sometimes they double things. You know, it's sure. just it's just Semitic doubling, which to me is just hand waving. It's like, well, you know, we don't really know why they do this, but, you know, they just sometimes they double stuff. Yeah. OK. I mean, that's not impossible. You do get. uh, uh in Acts, you have uh, Shaul, Shaul, Saul, Saul. Why do you pro uh, persecute me? Right. Mm -hmm. So you have in, in those cases a in that case, you've got a, a vocative that's that's doubled um, right. in address. And so the the general the general sort of the mo most common thing before my observation on this, the most common uh, explanation has been, well, this is just, you know, vocative doubling where, you know, a person is addressed and, you know, the name is doubled or the the title is doubled. Um, so, you know, along the lines of Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Um, and, you know, the al alternative to that is is displaying heightened, marking heightened emotion. That's a that's a um, uh, 
uh, a specific uh, explanation explanation as well. Now, there's really right. not a whole lot of evidence for that. And the, the problem with the heightened emotion thing is there's no heightened emotion in, say, Luke 646. Why do you address right. me as Adonai Adonai and not do what I say? There's no context of emotion there. So that's out from right. there. Uh, and then uh, and then you have the the final one you had uh Frenchkowski Marco Frenchkowski uh he he proposed that the doubling is uh representing acclamation of Jesus as the messianic king i don't know kuria kuria you know as an acclamation mm. uh and that really wasn't that 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 didn't catch a lot of traction uh you know when he when he made that case and still hasn't okay. um so those are those are the really really the only um other proposals that have been made of those the the idea that it's just a typical vocative dub doubling that happens in some semitic literature uh or semitic influenced literature is the stronger of the is the strongest of the of those proposals right. uh, the problem with it is that it doesn't account for all of them because uh again the the real problem is 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 luke 646 for this where why do you address me or call me Adonai Adonai? Mm -hmm. That's not in the context of uh, quoted speech where it's like, and you know, God said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Right. This is, you are calling me or labeling me Kurie Kurie. Right. And the, the yeah. form there is not, that's not the context in which you would expect the Semitic doubling. You expect right. the Semitic doubling when you have narrative and an, and a character speaks to another character and then you have the doubling. Right. But he's this doesn't himself. really fit that very well. This is okay. someone calling someone else something. And the, the thing that they're calling that person, the title that they're calling that person or the name that they're calling that person is the double courier. Uh, so that, again, is a problem for that. Now. The, for, the, the fourth explanation and the one that I offer is this works really well once we understand the double courier as mm -hmm. a, re a specific reference to a, an unambiguous use of the name. Right. Uh, and, and because we have well over a hundred examples, I mean, you got, you know, you got what, 300 some examples of that in, in the Hebrew Bible uh, alone. Once you once you have hundreds of examples of this in a body of literature that's very familiar to the to the gospel authors and the communities for which they're writing, that makes much more sense of specifically Luke 646, which is the one that that kind of is a problem for all the other options. Okay. Uh, and then one and it also fits all the other the other ones in, in Matthew as well. So that that provides a different a different angle for that as far as you know has this changed the 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 way that this works you know you, the, the second question that you had is this is this changed the way that this is being discussed or handled in in uh biblical scholarship it's a little too soon to to assess that uh for sure because okay. you know I, uh this was published what in um 2018 20 yeah 2018 and you know generally speaking you know, things so just a lot of people don't may not know this, but in biblical scholarship in, in you know, journals like this one, the turnaround on these is really it, it takes a long time. I mean, I first presented this article as a conference paper in 2010. Right. Eight years later, it came out. <laughs> right. Okay. I submitted it for publication in 2016. Oh, okay. There's a two year lag generally for the top journals in the field. You submit it, it goes through this process, and then two years later it comes out. Okay. There's often a three year lag for, you know, for monographs or, you know, let's say a two year la lag for, for monographs or, or, you know, the major books in the field. And those books are finished. So it's a lag of a two years usually from the time that the book is finished. And then it starts into the proofs and all of that. You have, you know, your peer review process, which is going to take six months if it's fast. Mm -hmm. And then peer review proceeds into, OK, the book is accepted. Then you go to project management and all of the process of getting everything edited and all of that. The book's been done. Peer review, 
then there's a little bit of revision, then you have all of the editorial processes. From the time that your that your book gets accepted, it's usually a little over a year to get it out. So you're looking at a year and a half to two years from the time that the book is done. Wow. And books and those sorts of things take time to write and are usually based on the things that are done or out, have been out for a little while before the person has actually gotten to those points in the book. Now, sometimes good off, good scholars will update as they as something new comes out, like, oh, I'm writing on Luke and oh, this article just came out and I just noticed it. I should go back and reincorporate this and readdress this within the book. Yes. But that doesn't always happen. So generally speaking, within scholarship, uh, it it usually takes about 10 years for a new proposal to really take hold within within from a from the time of publishing from the time of publishing okay wow so something published in 2018 you start to see some early influence in that sort of thing in a few things that get published say th- 3 4 years later you start to see the initial reaction to it then right and it's not until about 20, so 2018, it would be, you know, right now we're starting to see some of the beginnings of that. And I've gotten a number of citations and recent stuff where, you know, people have just said, okay, yeah, this explains that done. Uh, there's been no pushback on it at all. Right. Uh, but it's really going to be 27, 28 by the time you get to really having this kind of thing incorporated into the broader scholarly discourse and in and, uh, and either being push back against, which I don't think it based on the early responses that I've had within scholarship and conversations with other scholars, mm-hmm. the general conversation that I've had has been, I can't believe I didn't see this. <laughs> it's been a lot of that, like, that's, Oh, that's really there's good, kind though. of this face palm, yeah, the collective yeah, yeah. face palm of a lot of people. <laughs> uh, and that goes to the, the presentations that I had of this in 2010. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I presented it twice at, at academic com- uh, uh, conferences in 2010. And in each case, I had people come up and say, I was face palming the entire time you were talking. <laughs> wow. Because this like is the most obvious thing in the world and how, how we all miss this is bizarre. That was my but, thought when I read the paper. I was like, yeah. oh, duh. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it's just one of those things where it's just easy to miss if you're not yeah. reading. If you're not reading in the specific tradition that these that the Gospels are written out of, it's easy right. to miss. But as soon as you see that tradition, it's like, oh. <laughs> so I, based on conversational data, which is, you know, anecdotal and limited, I think this will probably do well and, and yeah. wind up being part of the, the broader scholarly consensus, uh, mm-hmm. you know, by the time you get to that point. But really, it's 28, 20, uh, 2027, 2028 before you really start to see stuff like that take hold. Uh, yeah. And it just takes a long, long time. And um you know, scholarship moves forward. There's a, there's also the phenomenon. Uh, it's it, you know mentioned in Thomas Kuhn's Structures of Scientific Revolutions, but he's not the one who is initially said this. Uh, but that scholarship moves forward one death at a time. Science moves forward one death at a time. And yeah. that's because the other thing is that those of us who are active practicing uh, scholars and, and working within the field we don't have time to read everything that comes out because every so much comes out every quarter, right? Every year that you can't keep up with all of it. So the, the, the things that really end up, uh, changing the field, they don't change the field until the next generation of scholars is being trained. So like this article will be something that people who are taking their doctoral exams and going through doctoral coursework and that sort of thing now will be reading and then will incorporate into their work. But people who are sort of on the tail end of their scholarship, you know, people who are in their 50s and 60s and 70s, they may not even read this. They may they may not come across it because they're working on something else that's very specific over here based on what they the, the knowledge that they've accrued over a long period of time. Right. Uh, and, you know, they've got a grade, they've got to teach, they've got administrative work, they've got all these other things. And it's really easy just to not keep up. It's mm-hmm. very, very hard to keep up with the new with the new things that come out uh, once you get once you get out into the field. And so it just takes a long time. Uh, you know, perhaps the most influential book uh, of 
scholarship from the last generation. Uh, I think without question, the most influential book in, in New Testament studies was E.P. Sanders, Paul and Palestinian Judaism, which was published in 1977. Uh, and that book, wow. the influence of that book, you started to see the major influence of that book toward the end of the 80s. You, you had initial reaction to it in the early 80s, without question. It started to take hold more in the late 80s. By the mid 90s, you're getting significant debates about it and all of that. And then by about 2010, it could be, you know, in the in the aughts into the early 20 teens, it was at that point that it could basically be taken as, taken for granted as like, look, this is reset things. Man. But that that's 27. No, that's 1977. 13 years later is 2000. It's between 13 and 23 years later, or 13 years later, I'm sorry, is, is 1990. Okay. 23 years later, between 23 and 30 years later is basically when you start to see it essentially take hold as like, this is this is basically default. Man. It takes that long. Yeah, okay. So I have one final question for you based on that. Um, in my apologetics experience, especially talking to Muslims, you know, they always ask, where did Jesus say, I am God, worship me? And there's a whole discussion about the literal words that he used, but everybody points to John. Do you see this coming forward as something that we can use to point to Matthew and Luke as well in the same vein and say, hey, look, it's right here. It's obvious. What do you think about that? So I do think Matthew and Luke in this, in these passages, Matthew and Luke are, uh, they amount to call to to saying that Jesus is divine and is rightfully uh, understood as 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 possessing the name. Uh, okay, and they do put it. I mean, this is in the mouth of Jesus, and they do this, I think, deliberately in in the writing. Now, I would differentiate. You know, as a scholar, I'm going to differentiate between what Matthew and Luke have Jesus say and what we what the historical Jesus actually said we we weren't on the ground you know we don't have access to anything beyond Matthew and Luke right uh but I do think Matthew and Luke put Jesus you know they they essentially quote Jesus as making a specific claim to rightful possession of the name okay. to where he is Good. uh is owed the uh, obedience and the honor and all of that that is owed to the one who holds that name. I see this being really useful when talking to modern Jews. Maybe they don't accept the New Testament, but you know, you go, hey, look, Ezekiel has this all over the place, and here's Jesus saying it in the New Testament. I don't know that it would be that useful in that context, because again, it, it, that, that, that's really a matter of authority and, and, and a matter of, you know, okay, so let's say Jesus did say that. And let's say Jesus does. Yes. Okay. So Jesus is laying claim to the same title that you see, or the same formulation that you see in Ezekiel. Hmm. That doesn't mean that a person should agree with Jesus on that or take Jesus at his word. He could the, be a lunatic, right? Right, or you right. know, or you know, or you could make the argument, and this is the ar ar argument of my of my old teacher Bart Ehrman. You know, he he takes the C.S. Lewis uh, Lord Liar Lunatic thing and adds legend to it, and mm -hmm. says, okay, well, you know, you could have Lord Liar Lunatic, or you know, you have the gospel authors that essentially have put put words in Jesus' mouth that maybe he didn't say, okay. which is an option. That is an option. Uh, and like I said, yeah. just go, appealing to the text is not going to solve any sort of apologetic matter with people for whom the text doesn't carry any authority. Right. Uh, and okay. that's really where ultimately what you see in in the New Testament is this sort of understanding that the, that that texts can't be the final source of authority. I mean, this is Second uh, Corinthians chapter three, where Paul talks about the difference between the letter and the spirit mm. and that ultimately it is, and he says to his church, he says, you are our letter, you know, written, right. written by the hand of God, not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of human hearts. Yes. And he basically makes the case that the, that the, that the, the real source of authority and the real argument has to be in the lives of the church. 
and the lives of the people in those churches. And if that, if that doesn't add up, then the rest of it's not going to be very persuasive. Uh, yeah. And yeah. so, good point. It, you know, I think that aspect has to be considered. And when it all boils down to it, without any evidence of significantly transformed lives, without evidence of answered prayer, and without any indication that they're, you know, uh, of those sorts of things, it's going to be a, an uphill climb uh, apologetically to, to mm -hmm. have a whole lot to say, uh, because this whole thing really does and any sort of Christian argument about this or about whether or not, you know, the argument that Matthew and, and Luke and, and John, and I actually think, you know, Mark does very similarly. I mean, Mark has three ego me sayings without the predicate. Mm -hmm. Jesus says it three times in Mark, each of them in a, in a very, uh, very pivotal point in the, in the Mark and narrative when Jesus is walking on the water, he says, uh, do not be afraid, ego e me, I am. Uh, and then when he is uh, uh, talking about, you know, many will come and come, uh, many, many will come in my name saying, ego e me, I am. Right. Which is, wait, that's your name? I am? Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, and that's in, uh, in uh, Mark, 13 and then uh when he testifies before caiaphas he says are you the messiah the son of the blessed and then in what is it i think 1362 something like that um he says ego e me kai and you will see the son of man so those three points so I, I think you could make the case that all four of the of the new testament gospels present jesus as laying claim to uh the name identification with the god of israel mm. that's you know, okay, once you've established that, you still have to deal with the credibility of the of the gospels in question. And you have to address the question of this all boils down to did Jesus get up from the dead? If he if he was raised from the dead, that that's really the the real question. I mean, that's, you know, that's Romans 10 stakes everything yeah. on did Jesus actually did he die and stay dead? Or did he raise from the dead and, you know, become exalted? And the evidence for that has to do with transformation and answered prayer. So I don't know that there's really any way of arguing past past that. I agree. I've seen that a lot with tons of other arguments, not just this one. You know, you bring out this argument you think is great, and then somebody goes, I don't even care. You know? Yeah, yeah. It, so yeah. for me, the, 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 the point of doing this kind of article is not, you know, this is not an apologetics article. It's not about like, oh, well, therefore Jesus is God. Okay. No, this is a matter of like, can we historically and critically read these passages better to understand what they what they said or what they say in the context of of uh, of their own historical, you know, in, in their own historical context? And I think that's that's really what what I'm aiming to do in this kind of kind of article. Uh, and, you know, what people do with it is a whole different question. Well, I think you did a very good job with that because I was pretty well convinced just by reading it. I read it twice because I had to, there's so much density in there, but uh, it is a dense article anyway. Yeah. But yeah, yeah academic, academic work, uh, it, it has a, has a certain density to it that uh, if you're going to do really good work and make sure that you're anticipating potential uh, pushback and making sure that you're, uh, you've adequately considered, you know, other potential angles and all of that, it, it requires a certain density. No, no question. Yeah. Um, oh, there you go. You froze for a second on my end, but um, thanks for talking to me, man. This is super enlightening. I learned oh, stuff appreciate even, it. even just in this. Yeah. Yep, Thank you very appreciate much. it. Always fun.